Hey everyone, welcome back to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace and I am again here with Mike Rugnetta from Reasonably Sound. Hello, hello. Hello. And today uh, we're going to talk more about noise and finish up our conversation from last week. Really quick for those people who weren't here, um, Seeker Plus is a show. We take a big topic and we're breaking it up into chunks. This week we're talking about noise. Go back and listen to the other episodes if you haven't. This is also Noise Week where we're looking at how noise affects us on a day-to-day -day basis and how it affects our environment and nature. And Mike, real quick, why are you here? Um, because I make a podcast that is about sounds. Uh, it's called Reasonably Sound. Uh, it's kind of about like the um, theory and science behind uh, all things audio, uh, trying to sort of look at the world. Th wait, look at the world through your ears? Can I say hmm. that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you can say it. I don't know if it makes sense, but I'm into it. I already did it, so yeah, we're going to go with now. it. So today we're going to, again, finish that conversation. We're going to talk about how noise is bad for you, how noise could be good for you, and how we might be able to use noise to our advantage. So let's kick into that. So to round out the end of the last conversation, we started to talk about how sound is a stressor for, yeah. for humans. Um, but it might not always be a stressor. I don't want to just, you know, get down on it all the time. Yes, noise pollution is a big deal, but there seems to be a Goldilocks kind of zone for noise. Is that correct? A couple years ago, there was a study that was looking at... In the Journal of Consumer Research. <laughs> my favorite journal. I'm serious. It's a great journal. Okay. I'm gonna, now I'm going to start reading it's the Journal really of Consumer good. Research. It's so funny. Lots of interesting stuff. Uh, they were looking at uh, the like urban soundscape um, mm -hmm. and sort of had this hypothesis that for the same reason you were talking about how um, there's a kind of mental activity that is triggered by a changing environment, uh, this changing sound of an environment, that it might also be true for people living in the city. Mm -hmm. And that if the sound is at this level where you're almost triggering your fight or flight response, you're, you're not stressed out, it's not so loud or so constant or grating that you're having a bad time, but you're stimulated in some way, it actually might make you more creative. Hmm. Uh, and that this could actually explain why people want to work in like cafes. That like oh, because it's the, kind of loud, but not loud. Yeah, like the din of you know clanking plates and the espresso machine and people talking and people you know just sort of general activity. Yeah, it's like energizes. Sort of energizes you, but doesn't stress you out. Hmm. Yeah, I mean our office here. We moved to a new office fairly recently at Seeker, and it's so quiet. It's so quiet, and so no one talks to each other. So we just like sit there and then one person says something or sneezes or and everybody laughs, turns around. and then everybody's like what just happened <laughs> what's the problem or someone starts talking to somebody really quietly and then they slowly get louder and it's like in an auditorium when suddenly now everyone's talking everywhere and then it you get that like oh wait lombard effect we were just be is that what that's, that's called? the lombia yeah. i think it's lombard <gasps> it's either lombard or lombardo where like you like people start talking quietly and then and then, and then someone talks over to, to be able to be heard and then someone talks over them and then everybody gets quiet and then there's that point where everybody stops their conversation at the same time and, and it's, it's like oh shoot we were all talking like there's Awkward. there's a moment where someone was like you know and that's how they saw my butt yeah and you're, <laughs> Or like somebody in like an auditorium or even an office, somebody will be like, huh. And then everybody kind of breaks the spell and realizes, oh, we were talking. Yeah. Or somebody on stage moves and everybody goes, oh, the show's about to start. And everybody just shuts up. Yeah. But in reality, there's no reason to do all those things. I mean. You guys got to get white noise machines. So you were mentioning this as well. There's like HVAC systems and white noise machines that yeah, like can be installed in offices to simulate this this decibel effect that kind of gets people active. Yeah, there were some, there were like productivity studies. It was, a, I think it was a while ago. It was like when the cube farm was first a thing. And I don't know whether or not this has been looked at again since, but um, I think that like people, yeah, felt uncomfortable talking to one another. Like they didn't want to talk to their coworkers because it felt like everybody around you was listening in. Yeah. And I imagine that's only exacerbated in the open office plan, which we're learning even more, like more and more every month about how bad it is. Yeah. And that productivity went up once people started installing white noise machines. And there's like a really classic one that is the, the, the one that I think was studied that like it's mechanical and it turns. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this, it like looks like a beige giant pill. Mm. Um, so they started installing either white noise machines or yeah, HVAC, and productivity went up because people felt like they could talk to one another. Hmm. That like you could have a conversation without 
like you said, everybody turning around being like, what are you, what are you, what are you, guys, guys, what are you guys talking about? Yeah. yeah. What's happening over there? You're going to eavesdrop on your conversation. <laughs> or like you don't even, not the, you, sometimes like you don't have a choice. If it's so quiet, you're just going to hear it anyways. Yeah. And yeah. then you don't want to have a situation where everybody's wearing headphones because that will diminish productivity in another way. Right. Yeah. Because you're all isolated. Yeah. It's such a weird balance. On top of that, silence can actually make people kind of go crazy. You know what I'm saying? There was, I actually, I did a, uh, um, I, I went to a very nerdy like electronic music school in Paris a number of years ago. This does not surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got to tour IRCOM, which is the f like the French um, Institute for Acoustic Research, has a very famous, very um, colorful musical history. You know, very very famous, very fancy. Yeah. Modern composers working there. And we got a tour, and one of the things we got a tour of was their anechoic chamber, which is mm -hmm. they. I think they said at the time it was the it was the quietest place in Paris. Um, I don't know if it still is. Yeah. But it's like underground. You go s several stairwells down. You know, walk out onto a plank in the middle of this thing. And the point of the anechoic chamber is that no sound gets in, no sound gets out, and sound travels um, as little as possible inside of it. So it's anechoic, like the sound doesn't bounce off of the walls and mm. then continue traveling. When it hits a wall, it just dissipates. Yeah. And that's just the, the material that's in there and the way the material is arranged. So what was makes it like? Happens. So I went in with, with a friend of mine. They didn't let us go in alone. Oh. They actually said, like they let two people in at a time and they would close the door so you could have the full experience. But they said, we don't let people who aren't used to it go in by themselves because it can be, and then in a, in a very sort of French way, the guy was like, disorienting. We we're like, what does that mean? Yeah. And actually, and I went in with, with my friend Randy and it was, it was weird. It was very strange. Yeah. Well, I mean, we evolved in nature, so we've never experienced silence. It's something that like we associate with the future and with like all of these. <laughs> being these, out in space. Yeah. Being out in space and all these goals that we have is, is like, it's clean and quiet. Yeah. And, and flawless but it's like we don't actually want any of those things and there's there is a i don't know if it was that one specifically but there's a really famous story about john cage the composer going into an anechoic chamber and it was this it was this like very meaningful life-changing experience for him uh that like you know he said that he heard the sound of his blood pumping and the sound of his synapses firing which like i don't you know, know. You can hear that. yeah some the you know, some years later, some neurologists and, and other people were like, you, you can't hear those things. You probably just had tinnitus. <laughs> but like his his response was, oh, there is no like as long as you're inside a human body, there is no such thing as silence. Mm. And so the rests in musical notation that say like, oh, don't play anything. They're kind of lies. <laughs> Yeah. Like, there's no silence in music. There's always something happening between the notes. It's just something that the composer isn't in charge of. And that's what led to John oh. Cage's famous sort of... That's the, what, 433? 433 and, like, indeterminacy was his thing. That it's yeah. like, you know, a composer is someone who just listens in a particular way, not someone who writes music in a particular way. Hmm. So, like, we're all Silence yeah. is, is noise, yeah. is noisy. Uh, it's almost like, what's the noise floor of the human experience, right? Yeah. And the noise floor is... Uh, for those that maybe didn't uh, get in there last time was it, it's the base level of noise no matter what happens this is how much noise is in the system the headphones that hiss you know that's that's where we're at right so what is the, the noise floor of a human I guess we couldn't really measure it because we have to be in our own heads to do it it's like, a, like you know it's probably like that that's just Mike let's move on to the natural environment then so this can be kind of extended back into the natural environment and we'll get into a little more about noise pollution and how mm -hmm. silence can also be a form of oppression in this way so that kind of the headphones and making sure we have too much silence is also almost bad yeah which i think is fascinating so think about like a quiet snowy plain right you know there's still things living there, you know, there's still people, there's still cars, you know, it could be the same place that you are in the summer when it's loud and there's birds and things and the highway off in the distance, but because of the properties of snow, they absorb the sound. Yeah. So you end up with this very, very quiet environment and it can feel somehow more threatening. I don't know if you've ever kind of tapped into your feelings when you stand on alone in a snowy area, but it can be a little like stressful. Well, it's weird. There's a there's a disconnect between what you're seeing and what you're hearing, right? Like you hear you look, you know, if you're in a snowy field or whatever, you're looking at this wide open space, but you hear something that feels 
much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. And that's always how I feel like when I go visit my parents who live, you know, in the suburbs near some like farms and stuff. That's always how I feel like it doesn't, what I'm hearing doesn't match what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. It sounds much, much smaller than it looks. Yeah. 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 And that, that gives an advantage to like a predator, for example, who's been like who's evolved in that environment so yeah. think like an owl trying to grab a rodent or something right? sure they have predator prey interactions that have uh, you know synchronized movements so an owl can fly so quietly because it's got feathers that are specifically designed to absorb sound and that way it can fly over a snowy plane and grab a rodent without the rodent hearing it on top of that that is so cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And it also reduces its energy expenditure to, to glide more than it's like flapping. Like if you think of a pigeon, they are yeah. not quiet when they're flapping around all the time. But like these birds have like evolved to be quiet because silence can also be kind of dangerous. Yeah. Whereas like noise, if it makes any, you know, that could be, that'd be great. So sound produced as a byproduct of locomotion could also be considered noise, which yeah. animals have pretty much evolved, including ourselves. Like... This doesn't make any noise. I'm moving my elbow for those who cannot see the video. But like you can throw a spear. Yeah, exactly. Silently. You know. But at the same time, if we build a machine that does this noise, it's almost always gonna make or does this motion rather. It's almost always gonna make noise. Yeah. To bring it back a little bit into humans though, noise triggers bodily responses that any stress would, uh, and it can actually cause real damage over time. So let me uh, quickly quote a landmark study, a 1975 study of mm -hmm. students in schools. And this comes back to that productivity question that we were asking earlier or talking about earlier. Quote, reading scores of children in classrooms near train tracks mm -hmm. were lower than the scores of children whose classrooms were quieter. So there's some like level of sound that's too much. Elementary school kids on lower floors that were closer to noise on a ground floor of a school also showed greater impairment yeah. as opposed to students who were on higher floors and it was somewhat more silent. So this was done in the New York area uh, and the Board of Education added soundproofing and adjusted tracks near schools. Uh, the MTA actually worked with the Board of Ed and they did this fairly quickly and they showed actual improvement in a follow-up study in the same region. So well, it's like pretty incredible how much noise can affect us in ways that you don't think about like it makes students less productive they make students not perform as well in their study yeah which you wouldn't think oh well yes my school was next to a train track but that was fine you know the teacher just you just paused. keep the windows closed or right, whatever exactly yeah. but in reality it can really mess with us um, there's also airports yeah. and people who live near airports chronic aircraft noise uh, also has been shown to affect children's learning. I don't know why they study children's learning a lot, probably because it's a controlled environment, but I don't know. And I know that they there's the like incidents, the closer you get to an airport, the incidence of heart attack, like, or like cardiovascular infarction of like some kind, like increases. Hmm. That like as you get closer and closer to the noisy environment of the airport, yeah. the number of people who have, you know, because we were talking about loud noise raises your blood pressure. If you yeah. just constant high blood pressure, yeah. your heart's going to work an extra hard all the time. And that's, that's bad for you. That's real bad. Some of the things that they cited in these um, student studies with teachers were communication difficulties, teacher and pupil frustration, yeah. so like not being able to hear the teacher, reduced morale, of course, impaired attention, increased arousal, not in like a dirty way, but like that's how scientists refer to like you have excitement in some way, you're, yeah. you're triggered, if you will, uh, and that influences task performance and can influence sleep disturbance, which would then go on to come back and influence your performance at school. And it, this can happen not just in the school. If you have a house near a train track and then you go to school and you've been impaired in your sleep, you're not going to learn as well. So this sort of comes to what you were talking about in your reasonably sound episode, right? Where there's some like class distinction between noise and silence. Yeah, there's so people have just started looking at this now. We have a pretty good sense, especially in the EU, there's been a lot of research about... Um, like the impacts that noise has on um, the people who are subjected to it and what the health risks are. But we're only just now starting to take a look at who those people are 
And uh, in the United States, there was a, a big study that was done last year where they grabbed a bunch of uh, different data sets. Um, it was like 1.5 million hours of audio recording, like zo zoning data, census data, all this stuff. Um, you know, there was they did some machine learning to it. Okay, okay. Uh, as you did, do these did days, the machine learning, um, and they figured out that it looks like uh, it is poorer communities and communities of color in the United States specifically that are the most subjected to levels of noise where there is a potential health risk. Hmm. Um, and that lines up with uh, previous research that's been done on air and water pollution. That like, um, basically within in between countries, uh, if you are poor or a minority, it is likely that y your like environment is suffers from some sort of environmental neglect. Yeah, or it, pollution in this case, yeah. like you were mentioning. So either noise or air or water or something. Yeah. And it's interesting because we usually ignore noise pollution and how it affects people. but. It really does have a lot of effects, which we've touched on already, you know, yeah. hypertension and all sorts of other things. So uh, noise pollution is actually on the rise, according to some studies. In the developed world, exposure to day-to-day -day social noise, as it's called, which is omnipresent music, cafe chatter, etc., mm. which I thought, oh, interesting. That's tripled in 30 years. Huh. Yeah, which is a lot. And according to the United Nations, 84% of the planet's humans are going to live in urban areas by 2100 which isn't that far away, although it might feel that far away. And by that point, there will be 10 billion of us. So it will not be getting quieter <laughs> yeah. in this aquarium we call Earth. Um, so it is important to understand the, the impacts of noise. The World Health Organization lists noise pollution as the number one environmental nuisance in developed countries. Number one environmental nuisance. That's a, that's, I'm surprised. I was also surprised. Yeah. That's why I wrote it in the thing. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And they said it has to be, you know, uh, all sorts of different things can cause it, obviously, um, but according to Neil Patel, who wrote into Futurism, traffic is the biggest contributor to noise pollution. A diesel truck at 50 feet can generate up to 90 decibels of noise, and anything over 85 is not great. It is also like reading all the studies of uh, like what people complain about, like what noises their, um, like interrupt their sleep or their work the most often. Mm -hmm. Traffic is always number one. Yeah. Uh, and then it's followed by, I think, neighbors is the second one. Well, neighbors are yeah, always the, the worst. worst. I agree. But when it comes to noise, I do want to not end on kind of a sour note, um, which isn't even, a, that's a flavor, not a, like a, but it's a sour it was, yeah, there yeah, could be, There like, can be a sour okay, note. Okay, I got, yeah. you know, I was trying to go with some noisy thing, but it it's, ended up being. Uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, visual primacy has made it so that we have to discuss sound related things using metaphor. Because it's hard it's to It's hard to, yeah. yeah. I, earlier I said, we, you know, we look at things through the world of sound. So yeah, that's true. He did say that. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but it was, it was weird. But noise is pervasive. Uh, it can be uh, problematic. But as we mentioned at the top of this, there is a level of noise, about 70 decibels, according to that Journal of Consumer Research study, I think, yeah. um, that can make you potentially more creative. And too much silence can also be bad. So kind of, sort of, how we started this whole discussion into noise of noise being sonic phenomena out of place, as we mentioned in the last segment, yeah. or as I mentioned in the first segment, it's more subjective, and if you want to spot that quasar, you have to filter out the noise of all of the other equally important quasars. Noise is bad, but also maybe... You kind of need it. Good. In communication theory, there's this idea of like signal to noise ratio that like, you know, you're the meaning that you're creating in whatever the system is, whether it's person to person communication or, you know, technological should be uh, robust enough to combat whatever noise is in the system, like whatever um, aberration is going to be injected into the message through whatever, however the system works. Um, and uh, what a lot of people say is that like there's no there's no noiseless system. Mm. There's no way to communicate with someone that doesn't inject aberration in some way. Right. And so like noise is kind of this symbol of the possibility of meaning. Yeah. That if there is no noise present, there's no system to communicate. Period. And so you know to yeah. say that you you kind of need it, I think holds a little bit of weight. You know. There's some there's some engineering smarties out there who were doing really smart stuff, you know, trying to get 70 that. years ago who said, you know, like noise is an important part of the system. They were talking about engineering systems, but it's I think even for, yeah, it's yeah. not that different like person to person or in a city or, you know. Just one last anecdotal example of that. 
Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> yeah? There's the engine noise all the time. Right? Oh, yeah. You're on a starship in the middle of nowhere, but for some reason, in a show, in a, in a fictional program, <laughs> they, yeah, they create it, and you can go on YouTube and 10 hour long, just like, wah, 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 for 10 hours, and it. people do. It's got millions of views, but they're not <laughs> viewing it, I'm yeah. sure. But it's like, these kind of noises are, they're pervasive, and you should be worried if you're exposed to too much noise, but a little bit of noise is fine. Yeah. It's moderation. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. Mike, where can they find you if they want to come listen to Reasonably Sound? You can find uh, Reasonably Sound most places that you listen to podcasts, also reasonablysound.com, also on SoundCloud, also reasonably SND on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. And he's good at the Twitter. It's Aww. pretty good. Thanks, yeah. pal. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez. You can find us at Seeker. Thanks for watching Seeker Plus. We'll be back next week with a new series. And we'll see you then. Ha, ha, ha.